A few sightings stand out in the history of ufology because they involve children, school children, from Australia, the UK, as well as Zimbabwe, all bearing similarities in what the children saw and the reaction they received. Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Project Blue Book. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. The first recorded sighting by a group of children took place at Westhall High School in Melbourne, Australia in the spring of 1966. Around 350 children and teachers witnessed five military airplanes surrounding a silvery flying saucer shaped UFO attempting to aerially herd the craft for about 20 minutes before it disappeared. They were all visited by government officials afterwards, advised to stay silent, as no one would believe them, and this was a military experimentation they were not meant to see. In October of 1977, in Northern Wales, at several primary schools, including Broadhaven and Upton Primary in Macclesfield, where 10 kids, aged 7 through 11, witnessed a silvery disc-shaped object hovering close to the ground, and a being came out of the vehicle to stare right back at him. Their teacher, Miss Hindmarsh, ushered them in and separated them immediately to make drawings of what they saw. What prompted this reaction, she cannot explain, but felt compelled to separate the children and instruct them immediately to record the experience in the form of pictures. She remembers thinking about not cross-contaminating their account, almost as if instructed herself. Let's remember these accounts were all collected and stored at the UK Department of Defense and later released to the public. These pictures are UK DOD archive documents. Six months earlier, on February 16th, at Rosibald School in Anglesey, North Wales, student Jones recalls playing netball with her teacher, Miss Mayor Williams, in the yard when he saw the object and shouted for everyone to look up. They all saw it, a silver cigar shape with a black dome on top gliding smoothly and silently across the sky. It remained in their sight for about three minutes before disappearing behind clouds. Miss Williams, too, ushered the kids inside and felt compelled to separate them and ask them to draw pictures, exactly what Miss Hindmarsh had done. It is, however, the Friday, February 4th, 1977 event at Broadhaven Primary, the third Welsh primary school where children experience sightings, that got most media scrutiny and coverage. Ten children between the age of seven and ten described seeing the silver dome craft. Two of them saw a flashing light on top. Six saw a tall man dressed in silver spacesuit standing beside the UFO when it landed. The pictures do them justice, drawn with the honesty and openness of a child's mind. The broad heaven event differs from the others in two main ways. The teachers did not witness the event with the children and did not believe them. They therefore sent them home for the weekend without individual recording of what they saw. It was only on Monday that the school head teacher, Ralph Levelin, instructed the kids to make a drawing. He became the focus of media attention, who immediately doubted the account. Even the BBC questioned the children, asking if they were sure they weren't helicopters or Harriet jets. And on Monday, February 7th, Following the Friday events, Levelin wrote in a school notebook that, quote, their drawings are remarkably similar, but although made independently, they were not produced until three days after the sighting of the 4th, today the 7th of February, so the children had the entire weekend to discuss what they had seen, end quote. Nevertheless, Mr. Levelin concluded they were telling the truth. The three events have since been dubbed the Dyfed Triangle events. Well, 
thought I saw the spaceship. I didn't see the man. The spaceship, it looked as a cigar shape with a dome on it. And it had a yellowy, orange to red light on the top of it. How clearly did you see it? Well, I, did, I couldn't see its face because it was too far away. Oh, you say you saw a man as well, did you? Yes. And what about him? Well, he was too far away to be seen as well. I was... My friend Philip here was trying to find a way over the stream and I was looking at the bushes up the top of the trees. And then uh, uh, suddenly this silver cigar-shaped object seemed to pop up from behind the bushes and uh, trying to take off, then it disappeared again. Are you sure it wasn't perhaps just a helicopter or an aircraft from the airfield near well, here? a helicopter could land there, but it, it's that's private property over there. And if they landed there, they could be prosecuted. And with an aircraft, the only thing they could get in there was a Harrier. Were you frightened at the time? Yes. Why? Well, I thought there would be a whole arm inside there or something. David Davies was one of the kids interviewed. He's devoted a good part of his life to studying UFOs ever since, described the following days as a whirlwind of media scrutiny, ridicule and confusion that as a child he did not fully understand, but remembers his frustration at people who did not see them and did not believe them. Quoting Davies, So many people are ridiculed for saying they've seen UFOs, he said, describing his secondary school life as a misery. Quote, I was beaten senseless purely because of what happened to me. It would have been so much easier to take back my story. End quote. If that doesn't infuriate, I don't know what will. A couple of weeks later, Miss Granville, who operated an inn at Broadhaven, claimed to see a landed UFO who, when she came closer, burnt her face and left her agitated. Lieutenant Cowan, an officer in the Royal Air Force at nearby Broady, visited Miss Granville's hotel and examined the site, but could not find evidence of a landing. He joked, should a UFO arrive at RAF Broady, we will charge normal landing fees, End quote. This stigma of disbelief, and we have similar societal models for this, like believing victims of sexual harassment, this stigma associated with being an eyewitness to UFOs and their inhabitants. This is the obstacle we must collectively overcome in order to progress to a place where we become ready for an encounter, communication and connection to the real world that surrounds us. Another almost identical event took place in a Zimbabwe elementary school in 1994, where 60 school children aged 8 to 10 at the Ariel School of Rua saw a UFO and its inhabitants with big elongated eyes in bushland area near their school playground. This was during a time where multiple UFOs had been sighted over Zimbabwe, Zaire and South Africa. BBC interviewed the children at the time, making the event a worldwide phenomena and a local UFO investigator came to the scene within days using Geiger equipment to detect radiation activity at the site where the children said the UFO had landed. The UK DOD documented 435 sightings in the 70s and 80s. When examined with the hindsight of time and compared, they form what logically looks like a deliberate pattern, eerily similar and intentional, each involving a small group of schoolchildren who have lived their lives to this day 50 years later, convinced of the existence and presence of UFOs amongst us because they saw it and remember it, like David Davies, as if it had happened yesterday. It's as if the whole program was an indoctrination of a new constant, that beings from another world do exist, they fly around our world in crafts that you can see, feel and touch, and they have inhabitants in humanoid shape not too different from ourselves. I believe it is not a coincidence that later that year, 1977, Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind was released for the first time on November 16th, 1977. And a month later, Star Wars Episode Four, the first installation of the series, premiered on the world stage. 
Each introduced the existence of other worlds, one depicting an epic battle between good and evil in a remote corner of the universe, the other describing what a first contact might look like to children as well as to adults. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book. And if you haven't already, please check out bluebook.tv, a free source for exploring the unexplained. Please subscribe, and each day, let's show compassion and kindness. I am Thor, and thank you for listening. Stay tuned, and see you next time.